All right, so I watched me inspiring philosophy versus Aaron Ra. Yeah, heavyweights of heavyweights. Biggest, baddest atheist in town. Fire-breathing, radical atheist. Puts terror in the hearts of the Christian community versus little Michael. <laughs> and Michael's, Michael's actually probably one of the stronger, probably maybe even the best Christian YouTube channel out there. In terms of the thoroughness of his preparation, he could be the best. It's a very, very good channel, and he does a lot of real solid background research that he brought to the table in this event. So I'll probably give a full accounting of the event in another video. Right now, I just want to zero on one thing. So there's this part of the Bible, okay, book of John, chapter 4, where Jesus meets the woman at the well. The woman at the well? Where, where you going with this one, Craig? Yeah, it's part of the Bible, dude. It's in the Bible, I swear to God. So he meets the woman at the well. And there's a part where he says to her, and this is a really interesting to think about, because Jesus says to the woman, there is the time coming when they, when, the, when they will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. So you see what Jesus does there? He commits the no true Scotsman fallacy. Yeah, Jesus Christ himself. This is what I've tried to point out in, my, in some of my other videos. The no true Scotsman fallacy is used really fallaciously. Now, Bear with me, I'm going somewhere with this. There are numerous parts of the Bible. If you think of the Bible as an instruction manual for the Christian, okay, I'm not using the Bible to prove the Bible, I'm not using the Bible to prove God, I'm talking about the Bible as an instruction manual for the practitioner of the faith. Now, nobody would argue that that's exactly what the Bible is, and that's what it's intended to be. And when we talk about whether Christianity is dangerous or produces benevolent results or dangerous results, we have to actually go to the source of the book. And what is the book actually telling people to do? And how is it telling people to behave? So the no true Scotsman fallacy is actually really appropriate because there's tons of admonitions about how to actually behave in the Bible. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ, which means you're supposed to not just become a Christian, but become a Christian means you're supposed to live, consciously try to live as a more Christ-like individual, which generally speaking means be more humble, a lot more humble. Be as humble as I am. That's how humble you got to be. Well, you don't think I'm that humble. All right, well, whatever. Humble yourself. Humble, 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 even more humble. you got to be the lowliest lowly that ever lowed. A mere hangnail on the fickle finger of fate. That's how humble you're supposed to be in Christian terms. A mere piece of cosmic dust. Now, you're supposed to humble yourself. You're supposed to be walk in love towards your fellow man. You're supposed to be merciful. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. And you're supposed to be more compassionate. Nobody would argue, not any atheist on planet Earth would argue that if you actually tried to internalize and embody that aspect of Christianity, which is the central tenet of the faith, that you'd be a dangerous individual. You'd be a benevolent individual. You're supposed to actually take on the Spirit of God, internalize it to become so that you humble yourself and to become a better servant of of your fellow man. Now this is stressed over and over and over again in the Bible. Ad infinitum in a bunch of different ways. It's the central point. It's the central point of Christianity. And there's not a person on earth who would argue that that's dangerous or not benevolent. You're supposed to become a better person. And a better person is defined by the people around you. As I pointed out in some of my last videos, my brother-in-law came out to California, saw the change in me, became a Christian almost immediately. Came a Christian on the spot, said, hallelujah, this is it, this is the real deal. Went back to New York. Every single solitary person in my family noticed the change in him for the better. He was more concerned with helping out members of the family, more, you know, benevolent. That's what Christianity is supposed to do. That's why I brought up the no true Scotsman fallacy. Now, Michael has a, has a, has a way of fra a framing device that's actually a really strong, really useful framing device. Intrinsic versus extrinsic religiosity that he brought up a few times. And he used it quite, kind of successfully in the debate. Again, I'll give a better accounting of the debate in another video, a more fuller accounting. One of the weakest, most fallacious counter-arguments 
that Aaron, it's a go-to argument by the anti-theist. Aaron Raw brought it up again tonight. See, just in brief about the actual debate that we saw, the substance of Aaron Ra's points, some of them are extraordinarily weak, but so far they have not been handled successfully. So they pop up again in almost all the anti-theist debates you engage with. And they're really convincing to the people who are on his squad. And just in terms of, a, uh, of his rhetoric and the force of his personality, you know, he's really, really powerful. And actually, I can understand exactly why he's a famous atheist, because he, when he starts talking off the cuff, he connects really powerfully and he starts saying what he actually feels about religion. I'm not saying that the argument itself is good. I'm just saying that his he starts really connecting in a way that's powerful and probably meaningful to the anti-theist watching. Probably, they probably like, yeah, go. So, just something to think about. But let's just deal with one leg of his substantive case against Christianity because it's so astonishingly fallacious. And again, what I just said was it's so astonishingly fallacious that I can't even imagine that it hasn't been killed off by the Christians. But it hasn't been. Comes up almost every single time. The Bible is a book of hate. The Bible tells you to do terrible things. This is almost mind-bogglingly, mind-bogglingly fallacious argument. Think of it this way. The reason why anti-theists always get away with it is because Christians being Christians never approach the argument the right way. So, for example, Aaron Ra will say, you know, the Bible tells you to stone a witch on Sunday and look how terrible it is and look how destructive that, that has been throughout history. Stone the witch. And then the Christian, thinking he's doing a service to God or thinking he's doing a service to Christianity, will start trying to justify the scripture, which is totally and completely and utterly the wrong approach, especially in a debate like this that's only two hours long. One, uh, usually it's not very convincing. You know, oh, the reason it says that is because you know, it does some whack job apologetic on why, why it says the toxic thing. Far more sensible approach would decimate the whole argument, okay, would actually literally decimate the whole argument. How many of these actual quote-unquote negative scriptures are there? 500, I think? I don't know. Go to the, go to the atheist website. Go to, the, go to their website. I think there's 500 total. The point of view of the behavioral change of the Bible is 150% crystal clear. You'd have to be an imbecile to read the Bible and not notice what it's actually trying to produce in the individual reading the book. So to argue that there are some relatively obscure scriptures, and if you're an atheist, you'll go, they're not obscure. Yeah, because they're on every single atheist website. But prior to atheists getting a hold of the Bible, they were completely obscure scriptures. Most of them, one or two weren't. The rest of them were like, you know... Exodus 21. <laughs> I mean, obscure. Not exactly stuff that's front. You walk into a church, put it this way, you don't walk into a church across America and they got Stone a Witch on Sunday written across the, the, the written across the, the um, written on the, the wall. They'll have, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. They'll have the positive, life edifying, life affirming scriptures, of which there is a hundred to every one negative scripture. That's the point. The underlying substance of the, of the argument is absolutely astonishingly fallacious. The substance of the argument is there are negative scriptures in the Bible and somehow they mysteriously and completely and utterly outweigh the importance of the far more numerous positive scriptures in the Bible. The Bible is not neutral on the behavior of the individual reading it, but it takes a point of view and that point of view is to make them into a better human being and far more benevolent and not in any way, shape, or form more dangerous to their fellow man. Honest to God. That's central tenet of Christianity. That's the actual beating heart core of the faith. Worshiping the Father in spirit and in truth. For example, Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. That's the beating central tenet of Christianity. There's not a church in this country outside of the Westboro Baptist who wouldn't say that's central to the faith. Imitate Christ. Imitate Paul as he imitates Christ. 
And then it spells out almost crystal clearly what that is supposed to produce in you, the actual practicing human being. First of all, let nothing come out of your mouth except for it be for the edification of others. Nothing. So you're supposed to do nothing but try to build people up. And you're supposed to humble yourself. Wash, the, metaphorically speaking, wash the disciples' feet. Become the greatest amongst you shall be the servant of all. You're supposed to humble yourself and use the spiritual transformation in yourself to start serving your fellow man in a way that they see your good deeds. This Again, this is the Bible itself. See your good deeds and praise your Father who is in heaven. So people are supposed to know you're a Christian because you're being so useful and good and, serve and of such service to them. That's how they know you're a Christian. And then they go, wow. You know, I'm not sure if I believe Craig about this Christianity stuff, but he certainly is a nice guy. <laughs> he certainly is he's certainly really, really cheery and nice and helpful. Case closed. There's no way anybody argue with that, that you're a dangerous person or that Christianity will be dangerous. People haven't practiced it correctly. That's my point. That's why I brought up the no true Scotsman fallacy. I mean, I'll give a full accounting of the video. I just wanted to break down that one part right there. Um, that's all. Amen.